And that means that all of us who are here tonight, extra in your life. More power in your life. Progress in your life in Jesus' name. Your family is going to experience something more. Raise up those hands and let those, let those hands be anointed. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for our brothers and sisters, our leaders who are here tonight. We thank you for those who are still coming on the way. We thank you for the joy of the Lord and for the desire to serve you every time. Whatever the condition around us, the aspiration, the ambition, the desire, the forward march, I must be there and your people are here. I'm asking, Lord, you bless everyone tonight in Jesus' name. In all our various uh, locations, uh, districts, and groups where we're gathered together. And the word is reaching out to everyone. I pray, Lord, your mighty power will come through to everyone in Jesus' name. And also for all the regions and all the states and all the countries where the word is coming right now. I pray, Lord, something more, something greater, something more fruitful. You bring to every life tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody must go back home with something today. Impact every life. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. You must give a better amen before you sit down. God bless you. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, we're looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of the doctrine of baptisms, and of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. Tonight, as we look at those three verses of scripture, we're looking at the steady progress of consecrated, sanctified leaders. Progress, but steady progress, steadfast progress, the steady progress of leaders, leaders who are consecrated, leaders who are committed, leaders who are steadfast, leaders who are sanctified. The topic tonight, the steady progress of consecrated, sanctified leaders. As we come to this chapter 6, of Hebrews, we need to understand that we're coming from chapter 1, and the writer, Paul the Apostle, has already told us what Christ has done, what he has done for you, for me, for everyone. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. But chapter 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things. By the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, that's what he has done for us already before we get to chapter 6. He has purged our sins and now he's seated, he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Look at chapter 2 and read verse 11. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. He calls us brethren. Because he has purged us. He has saved us. And here it says he has sanctified us. Look at chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren... Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. He's telling us before we get to chapter 6, he says, this is who we are. We're brethren, we're holy brethren. 
were saved, our sins are forgiven, were purged. And then it tells us that results in our sanctification. He has sanctified us and we are one with him. Here it says, we're even partakers of the heavenly calling. Chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast a profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like a swear, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It says our inheritance is so much, it's so deep, it's so high, it's inexhaustible. It says, in fact, whatever trial we have, whatever temptation we have, whatever circumstances may be around us, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and we'll find mercy and find help. Any, any challenge we have in the time of need. It tells us now in chapter 5, verse 12, it says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, it's saying that we've got enough, we've learned enough, we've received enough, we've experienced enough to be teachers, but we do not know the depth and the height, the length and the breadth, the volume and the greatness of what we have. And so we're still expecting that somebody will feed us when actually we're now in a position to feed other people, teach other people, lead other people. And thank God you are here tonight because you are leaders and you accept you are a leader. You accept you are a teacher. And you are not like the people that said, give me, give me, give me. I don't have anything to give. I'm looking at you there. You have something to give. You have something to share. And you have something to impart into other people's lives. And the people that come close to you, they'll have the effect and the power of that teaching the Lord has given you in their lives in Jesus' name. But you know, he spoke to the majority of the people, the Hebrew Christians. He says, ye have need that won't teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He says, because in verse 13, for everyone that useth milk, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For you say, babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use, what that means is that they've got the scriptures, those who are taking strong meat, and they have used the scriptures. Somebody is a soul winner. He has used the scriptures to bring conviction on a sinner. By reason of use, is becoming an adult. Somebody is a counselor. He has made use of the word of God to encourage somebody. By reason of use, using the word to the profit of the people. Somebody is a teacher of the word. He might be teaching an individual or teaching a group of people or teaching us like our teacher taught us tonight. Is using the scriptures, is enlightening us. Is using the scripture as a key to open our understanding. He said such people are living and they are being maintained and nurtured by strong meat. Because by reason of use, it says they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That is, discernment has come in our lives now. We're able to discern, that's not right. I can't do that. That's good. That's what God expects me to do. 
Why are you doing the good thing you are doing? You can lead the person to a chapter, to a verse of the Bible because you discern both good and evil. Why are you not doing this? Why are you not running with them to this a kind of riot? Because you have the knowledge of the word of God. You discern between good and evil. That discernment makes you to say, because of this scripture and because of who I am, I'm a child of God. I can't do that and nobody can confuse you. You will not be confused in Jesus' name. Now he says, because some people are babes. And because some people are not growing up, it says now, therefore, look at chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, therefore means because of what we have learned, we need to do something now. It says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. It says, because of the more excellent ministry of Christ, it says, because of the perfect sacrifice of the Son of God. It says, because of the greater priesthood of Christ. It says, because of the all-sufficient grace of God available to us, and we can come to the throne of grace, and every form of grace we need is available. It says, because of the eternal power of the word of Christ, upholding all things by the power of his word. That's in chapter 1. It says, because of the provision of our peace, the provision of purity, the provision of power, the provision of his priesthood. It says, because of the possibility of progress. It says, because of our partnership with him. It says, because of his perfection, the perfect sacrifice that he gave on the cross of Calvary. Let us move on. Let us go on to perfection. You will move on. And you are going to grow in Jesus' name. Look at those three verses again. Verse 1, there's a word there, principles, principles. Verse 1, there's another word there, perfection. And between the principles and the perfection, there is a road, there is a path. The principles, the basics, the rudiments, the elements, the foundation, and the beginning, the commencement, and then the ultimate, the final, the perfection. And there is a moving from the principles on to, tell me, perfection. That means there's progress, three things. Number one, principles. Number two, progress. Number three, perfection. And if you are steady like that, and you begin at the principles, then you move on, you move up, and go on, you're making progress. Then you have perfection. Tonight, the steady progress of consecrated, sanctified leaders. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. It's right there in verse 1. The principles of the doctrine of Christ. Number two, the progress in our dedication to Christ. We'll start from the principles. We're making progress. The progress in our dedication to Christ. Point number three, the perfection in true devotion to Christ. When you're truly devoted fully devoted, permanently devoted, purposefully devoted unto Christ, there's perfection in that. The perfection in true devotion to Christ. We come to number one, the principles. We're coming to verse one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You see, there are two words there that are connected. One word, 
principles. The other word, foundation. It's like when you are having a building, a great building, like the building in which we are now. There is a foundation. And it says, leaving those principles, leaving, those, leaving that foundation, what does that mean? Let's say you come to those who are doing the building. The first month, they dug, they established the foundation. And you look all around, they've done the foundation. The second month, you come again, and they're still doing some things on the foundation. Maybe they are pouring water so that the concrete will be hardened enough to take the building. The third month you come again and they're doing something on the foundation and they're still putting some edges and all that. And you say, we've been on the foundation all the time. When are we going to leave the foundation and go to the real building? To leave the foundation does not mean abandon the foundation. No. It doesn't mean destroy the foundation. It means the foundation is established. The foundation is put in place. And the foundation is solid. And the foundation is unshakable. And the foundation is undoubtable. And the foundation is firm in the lives of the people. Now we can leave that foundation the way it is and build on it. So, leaving the foundation does not mean abandon the foundation. Destroy the foundation. Take away the foundation. Make the foundation useless. Make the foundation unnecessary. Make the foundation redundant. No, it is you've done enough on the foundation. Leave that foundation and then move on. The principles of the doctrine of Christ. What are these six things? Look at them. Number one, verse one. The re repentance from dead works. Number two, faith towards God. Number three, the doctrine of baptisms in the plural. Number four, the laying on of hands. Number five, resurrection of the dead. Number six, eternal judgment. Let's examine the foundation, the principles. Number one, repentance. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17. These are the principles. These are the rudiments. These are the elements. These are the primary elements. Like we go to primary school before we can go to secondary school. Like we go to primary school and we have to establish the primary elementary knowledge before we can eventually go to the university. Elementary, very important. And when we get to secondary school, we don't forget, we don't throw away what we learned in the primary school. And when we get to university, we do not forget the alphabet. We do not forget sentence construction. We do not forget handwriting that we learned in the primary school. That's established. We don't go to primary school again, but we're making use of what we learned in the primary school for the rest of our education. Acts chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 30. It says, at the times of this ignorance, God went out, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Do you know that while you're at university, there's some people that are just starting primary. While you graduate, there are others that are just starting primary. And while you're doing postgraduate, there are children just starting primary. Repentance is always there. Repentance must always be preached. While the leaders are learning something higher, something greater, there are people that are still just coming into the kingdom and repentance must still be emphasized for them. We're told in Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, we're reading from verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, 
It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that, tell me, all should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. Leaving the foundation, leaving the principles does not mean uh, that today you are not going to emphasize repentance because you see there are people who are still to start at that rudimentary level. Not only that, even though so have repented before, but something went wrong. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. It says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and repent. You see, repentance is always there, but if you have settled that, now you can move on. Number two is faith. Look at, come back to... Uh, come back to Hebrews chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Again, that's uh, where we started. Faith towards God. But you understand? That when we came into this world, we drank water. And guess what? After we drank the water, then we took milk. Water and milk. Water and milk. Water and milk. And then we now need to add something, solid food. But as we leave water, that doesn't mean we abandon water. We leave water in the sense that we're no more feeding on water alone. We feed on water, we feed on milk, we feed on bread, we feed on rice, we feed on, we feed on other things, but we're no more just feeding on water. The same thing will come to faith. Faith is at the foundation. How do you get saved? By faith. We're looking at Hebrews, sorry, we're looking at Ephesians. Chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And you cannot say, I'm through with faith, because I have been saved by faith. And the scripture says, living the principles and faith toward God is one of them. So I leave that. I abandon that. No, I don't leave that. We drink water. Even as, you know, we get older and older and older, we keep on drinking water. But we leave it in the sense that we're not drinking only water. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe. Every time you come to God, an apostle comes to God, he must believe. A preacher comes to God, he must believe. A pastor, a teacher is coming to God, he must believe. Somebody who is saved is coming to God for sanctification. He must believe. A sinner is coming to God for salvation. He must believe. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So faith continues. But you know something, you know? There are people, look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, or reading from verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 12, chapter 5, verse 12. Having the mission because they have cast off their first faith. Those ones, they misunderstood. When it says leaving the principles, Live repentance, they misunderstood. 
leave faith they misunderstood as see okay no more faith faith is still there water is still there they have damnation because they left their first faith come back to hebrews chapter 6 verse 2 number three now of the doctrine of baptisms the baptism there is that singular or plural i can't hear church it's plural and so you understand number one there is water baptism number two there is baptism into christ number three there is the baptism in the holy ghost and so he says these are the principles these are the elements this is the foundation water baptism matthew chapter 28 what you didn't hear from verse 20 from verse uh, 19 matthew chapter 28 verse 19 go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and it says lo i am with you always even to the end of the world after repentance and um, faith in christ there's water baptism but there's another kind of baptism you are baptized into christ you are immersed into christ romans chapter 6 reading from verse 3 romans chapter 6 verse 3 know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into jesus christ were baptized into his death therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life it says we're immersed into christ not just into water we become part of christ we're not members of his body and he is a head and he tells us in verse 5 for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall also in the we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified what's he and the body that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin what about baptism baptism into christ and spirit baptism matthew chapter 3 verse 11 in matthew chapter 3 verse 11 i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire you see that what a baptism baptism into christ and holy ghost baptism he shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We'll come back to Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm reading here from verse 2. The principles, the elements, the rudiments, the primary level experience, repentance, faith, baptisms in the plural now the lean on of hands chapter 6 and verse 2 of the doctrine of baptisms and of lean on of hands as you think about the ministry of the disciples and the apostles 
There's a laying on of hands, number one, for healing. We're coming to Mark chapter 16, reading from verse 17 and verse 18. It says, and this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Amen. They shall, tell me, lay hands on the sick, and it shall recover. It says, that is rudimentary. That is elementary. It says, the laying on of hands for the sick. But as you come to the Acts of the Apostles, you wonder that uh, Peter appeared in chapter 3. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. In the name of Jesus Christ, tell me, rise up and walk. Why didn't you go and lay hands on him? He could, but that's elementary. And Paul in chapter 14, looking at that man that was born lame, and he saw that he had faith to be healed, he shouted, rise up on thy feet, and he rose up. Why didn't he go and lay hands on them? Because that's rudimentary. He could if he wanted to. There's a laying on of hands for the sake. Also, there's a power in the name of Jesus. There is even the shadow of Peter that is passing by, and he doesn't have to lay hands on them. That's rudimentary. That's elementary. And a shadow came upon them, and they were healed. Everyone, I pray, will move on. And then there's a laying on of hands for the ministry. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed on the Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. That's the laying on of hands to commit, to commission, to ordain, to send forth into the ministry. Acts chapter 19. We're reading from verse 6. Acts chapter 19, verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and he spake with tongues and prophesied. They were saved and sanctified, and hands were laid on them for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. First Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Chapter 1 of Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And so, to transfer the gifts of the Spirit into a minister, you also have the laying on of hands. Number five, resurrection. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead. That's a fundamental doctrine, resurrection of the dead. There is resurrection. We're told in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 28. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming, 
in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. He's saying that those who are in the graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man. Look at verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Resurrection. First Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also that which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and, the, and the, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It says there's going to be the resurrection of the dead, and then we which are alive, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I pray you'll be there. Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, reading from verses 2 and 3. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Saints would be resurrected to life everlasting to have the reward. Sinners will be resurrected to Backsliders, those who die in backsliding will be resurrected too, but to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3, and they that be wise shall shine at the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. You'll be there. I said you'll be there. We're coming back to Hebrews chapter 6, reading from verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Here the writer says, let there be no doubt in you that this is fundamental, this is foundational, this is principle, this is elementary, this is primary. This is one of the elements. There's going to be eternal judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Appointed unto men once to die, after this, the judgment, chapter 10 of um, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 27, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fairy indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, under two or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment, suppose ye shall leave a thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith it was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him 
that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There is judgment. That's the reason why we're evangelizing and we're warning people and we're calling on them. Come to the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he has done. Whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore. The terror of the Lord will persuade men, but were made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And so we learn there are the principles, elementary knowledge, foundational knowledge, and once that is established, like we've established the foundation of a house, we leave it intact. We don't abandon it. We don't destroy it. We don't quit from it. We leave it intact. Because other people that are coming in, they still need that repentance. And they still need that faith in God. And we all still need faith in God. And then the baptisms and the laying on of hands and the resurrection and the knowledge of eternal judgment we now come back to hebrews chapter 6 reading from verse 1 point number 2 the progress in our dedication to christ the progress in our dedication to christ it says in chapter 6 verse 1 therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on unto perfection let us go on. That means, let us make progress. Let us make progress. You're wondering, how do I make progress? How do I measure progress? What are the means of progress? What's the mode of the progress we're talking about? Let us go on. Let us move on. Let us make progress. How do we make progress? How do we go up? How do we grow up? How do we move forward? How do we get enlarged and increased in the things of the Lord? There is one word that shows we're making our progress. Let's look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And you need to check up this word in your own life. Because this is the word that describes the progress. That you're going on. That you're moving on. That you're growing up. We're coming to John chapter 15 verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That's not for you. You'll bear fruit. I said you'll bear fruit. This is your part now. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth, tell me, more fruit. The word is more. The word is more. How do you understand you are growing in knowledge? More knowledge. How do you understand you are growing in strength? More strength. Once you can use the word more and more and more, it means that you are growing. And so, number one, more fruit, more fruit. He purges us, he cleanses us so that we can bear more fruit. And the fruit of repentance is more visible today in your life. Praise the Lord. And the fruit of righteousness is more, is more evident in your life today. Praise the Lord. And the fruit of more knowledge in the way of God is, uh, is more. We, we praise the Lord. The fruit of more commitment, we can tell, like I said at the beginning, of the rain and waste, everything that's going on around, for you to say, I must be there. 
maybe some years ago you'll say looking outside i don't think i'm going to go out today but thank god you are growing you'll continue to grow in jesus name number one more fruit number two more grace more grace we're looking at james chapter four james chapter four and i'm reading here from verse six but he gives more grace he gives more grace once the grace of god grace for salvation grace for sanctification grace for overcoming temptation grace for pulling through in that conflict grace in submission to the lord grace in obedience to the lord more grace that's the that's the growth we're talking about number three more faith more faith we're looking at first thessalonians chapter one first thessalonians chapter one we're reading from verse three it says in verse three remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our lord jesus christ Paul the Apostle said, I remember, I observe, I recognize that you have faith, your work of faith. By the time he wrote to them, 2 Thessalonians, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet suitable, because your faith grows exceedingly. Your faith grows exceedingly. You see, they had more faith. That's how we know that we're going on. We're moving on to perfection. Number one, more fruit. Number two, more grace. Number three, more faith. Number four, more devotion. More devotion. You are more dedicated to the Lord today than you were last year. You are more committed to the Lord, submissive to the Lord this year than 10 years ago. It is that devotion that is more, that is greater, that is higher, that measures our moving on. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 verse 11. The word more. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. More noble. What, what showed they were more noble? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. More devotion. Number four. Number five. More love. More love. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're reading from verses 9 and 10. To make sure that you are growing, you have to find out if the word more can be seen in your life, can be measured in your life, can be monitored in your life. That more, more, more. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye, have, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. But look at verse 10. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia, but will beseech you, brethren, that she increase, tell me, more and more. That's the thing that shows that we're moving on because there's more love. Number six, more diligence. More diligence. We come to Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 22. Second Corinthians chapter H verse 22. You see, you need to measure this growth we're talking about because some people don't understand how do I measure that growth in my life? 
How do I measure the growth in my ministry? More diligence. Look at chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things. We have proved him diligent in many things, but now much more diligent. You see, when somebody is devoted, but now more devoted, diligent, but now more diligent, serious, but more serious, committed, but is now more committed, that's growth, that's growth. And you cannot, uh, you know, make him abandon the things of God because that's his life, that's his heart. If you were to come to him five years ago, you could maybe stop him and you could hinder him, you could discourage him, but now he is more diligent. That's the growth the Lord is talking about. And he says, upon confidence which I have in you. Number seven, more sacrifice. More sacrifice. Well, you're able to sacrifice today much, much more that you could sacrifice before. You could sacrifice even your place and position for another person in honor preferring you know, others. You know, in the past, you'll say, that's my right. That's my place. That's my position. That's my privilege. But now, he, he needs to do something. And so, I give it up. I love it. I want to do it. But I love him and I prefer him. Because of that, there is more sacrifice. Second Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. You see that? To their power. That's what they did. Yea, and bear a record of them. Yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first they gave of their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They did more than we expected, more sacrifice. Can you sacrifice today much more than you could sacrifice last year? Can you give up something today and not hold on to it? It's mine, it's mine. Like you did about two years ago. Can you sacrifice more? More compassion. More compassion. We're looking at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Maybe in the past where you looked at people suffering, people having a need. Well, I have needs too. I have challenges too, I have problems too, or today, because of moving on and because of going on, there is more compassion. You are thinking less of yourself and you are thinking more of others. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 35, and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pens and gave them to the host. And said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more. There's no limit on my sacrifice. There's no limit on my compassion. There's no limit on my care. I want him well. And I'm depositing this to days wages to pay. Take care of him. And whatsoever, whatever the amount, you spend more. When I come, I will repay it. More compassion. He had compassion on that man. Number eight, more service. More service. That's what shows that we're growing. Thank God you are growing. Are you in the house? I said, thank God you are growing. Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19. Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from verse 19. 
more service. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. Look at this. And the last to be more than the first. That's growth. That's growth. And the last, your latter works, your latter commitment, your latter service, your latter excitement in serving the Lord and serving the people of God is greater, is more than what we ever saw before. Look at um, now Philippians chapter 1, number 10, more boldness, more boldness, you know, more timid, you know, have backbone, you know, too strong feet to stand, and you have the courage, the boldness, more than ever before, to declare the whole counsel of God, more boldness. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1, verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. That's what shows we're moving on. That's what shows we're growing. Now you are deliberate. Now you are calculated. Now you are bold. Now you are courageous more than ever before. More boldness, number 11, more obedience. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out, your own salvation with fear and trembling. More obedience to the word of God. Number one, more fruit. Number two, more grace. Number three, more faith. Number four, more devotion. Number five, more love. Number six, more diligence. That's right. Number seven, go ahead. More sacrifice. Number eight, more compassion. Number nine, more service. Number ten, more boldness. Number eleven, more obedience. Number twelve, more forgetfulness of self. More and more, you are forgetting self. In remembrance of the Savior. More and more, you are forgetting self. In remembrance of our sanctifier. More and more, you are forgetting self. In the place of the church. You are putting the church as one. As number one. Because your ministry to the church now is number one. You don't care. You don't mind what pain you go through. And you don't care what jungle you might have to traverse and what thongs might be in the way and you have to cross a path of thorns because there is more forgetfulness of self. You remember that you need to serve and that service is the most important, it's more important and therefore you forget self. We're looking at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 3. In Luke chapter 21, verse 3, And he said of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. This poor widow has cast in more than they all, for all these have cast in of their abundance unto the offering of God. But she, of a penury as cast in all the living that she had. She forgot, what am I going to eat after the service? If I cast in everything I've got, she forgot herself. 
I don't have any husband. I don't have any breadwinner. I don't have any means of support. I don't have any other place. I'm going to get resources. And this is all I have. This is all I have. And I need to give this unto the Lord. She forgot herself. And when you in your Christian life, in your Christian devotion, when well, you're forgetting yourself more and more, and you're remembering the church needs this, and the service of God needs this, they need, it needs my expertise, it needs my skill, it needs my knowledge. Am I going to care for myself? Forget about that now, sir the Lord. That's what the Lord is saying uh, when there's more forgetfulness of self. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 45. Jeremiah chapter 45. Uh, I'm reading from verse 5. In Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5, seekest thou great things for thyself? Things in the plural. What were you seeking in the past when you were younger? What were you seeking in the past when you were a new convert? What were you seeking in the past? Anytime you heard about a faith, about prayer, what were you seeking? Many, many things. But it says, seekest thou great things for thyself, seek them not. Think about the Lord. And set your affections on things on high and not on things on the earth. We're coming back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, we'll come to point number 3 now. The perfection in true devotion to Christ. The perfection in true devotion to Christ. It says uh, from verse 1, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Let us go on unto perfection. Perfection is a word that intimidates some people, frightens some people. But you know, it doesn't need to frighten us at all because actually it's the work of God in us. All we need to do is come and lay ourselves on the altar of the Lord. And then he does the perfecting. As we look at the Bible, when it says, go on unto perfection. You can remember some people, even in the Old Testament, Enoch, he went unto perfection and walked with God until he was not, because God took him. Think about Joseph, and you'll find also there's nothing, no sin recorded against his life. And then you look at Samuel, and you find those people there in the Old Testament. Here is Ezekiah that came to the Lord and said, Lord, I hear the message from my sir that I'm going to die. No, I'm not ready yet. Remember, I have served you with a perfect heart. And look at Isaiah. Look at the perfection. Look at Jeremiah. Look at Ezekiel. And then look at Daniel. All those people, they tried to find fault in his life. They could find none. And so as you look at the old covenant, you'll see it's not a strange thing. Let us go on unto perfection. And then you come to the New Testament. As Jesus spoke about perfection. And he says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If he knew we couldn't be perfect and is commanding us to do that, that should not be right. That should not be right. He knew we could never, never be perfect. And yet he said, be ye perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And come and look at Peter after Pentecost and look at John and then look at Paul the apostle and look at all those people who read about in the New Testament perfection is a possibility perfection is a reality look at the Bible number one perfection under the old covenant perfection under the old covenant we're looking at Genesis chapter 17 and I'm reading from verse 1 perfection in the old covenant. It tells us in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and tell me, be thou perfect. How can a teacher give a test? 
to a person, to a student, and he knows that student will never pass that exam, that will not be right. How could God demand, be perfect? Walk thou before me and be thou perfect if he knew he couldn't be perfect. Let's look at Gen Genesis chapter 5, and I'm reading here from verse 22. Genesis chapter 5, we're reading from verse 22. It says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. 300 years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and it was not for God to him. He was not for God to him. That's perfection. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 18, Verse 13, I'm waiting for you to open your Bible. Are you there? I said, are you there? Okay, one, two, three, go, everybody. You see that? Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Old covenant, old covenant. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 20. Second Kings chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 3. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 3, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have watched before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. This is a pain before the Lord, and I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiah wept so, and it came to pass, for before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Turn again, and tell Ezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days. Tell me. Are you in the house? I will add unto thy days. Fifteen years. I will, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. You know what I prayed? I have walked with a perfect touch before thee. That's under the old covenant. We're coming to Job chapter 1 verse 8. Job Chapter 1, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. This is God talking about a man, testifying about a man, recognizing the life of a man Job, a perfect and upright man. One that feareth God and is choice evil. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Job, chapter 2, verse, uh, it's chapter 2, verse 3, verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, as thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is choice evil, still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou art thou moots me against him to destroy him without cause. Number one, perfection under the old covenant. We're coming to Daniel chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 3. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion. 
That's a perfect man. And no fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error of fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we'll find it against him concerning the law of his God. Perfection under the old covenant. Number two, perfection before his offering at Calvary. Perfection before the offering at Calvary. Christ came. And he began to teach people. And as he was teaching them, here is what he emphasized. He wanted them to be perfect. The grace was there. Calvary has not happened yet. The cross has not been put in place yet. And yet Christ demanded there will be perfection. Perfection before the offering at Calvary. Look at chapter 5 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5 before Calvary. Verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. It says you come to God, and you have the desire to fulfill the will of God, the Lord can do it in your life. Once you lay yourself on the altar, and you consecrate everything, we're coming to chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, Jesus said unto him, remember, this before Calvary, before the cross, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go sell that thou hast, because his might was on what he had, on property, on silver and gold, on material things. And his heart, his mind, his interest, his attention, affection was consumed by that. And that thing became an idol. And Jesus said, you want eternal life? Go sell all that you have and come follow me. You'll be perfect. It says, uh, if thou wilt be perfect, go sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. That man was not able to do it, but look at verse 27. Then answered Peter and said, Behold, we are forsaking all what you told him he couldn't do, we have done. By grace, you will do what he wants you to do. I will follow thee. What shall we have therefore? That was before the cross. Look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 14. The perfection he demanded, the perfection he desired, even before the cross, before Calvary. It says in Luke chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 40 here. It says, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And you remember, when Jesus was about to leave, he now told them that you'll not just be as your master. He that believeth in me, tell me, the works I do, he shall do also. And tell me, greater works than these shall ye do. Because I go to the Father, the possibilities are there. You will move on to perfection. You will go on to perfection. You will not be sliding back or looking back or drawing back anymore. It says, let us go on. Let us go on unto perfection. And now, much more so after Calvary. Much more so after that final sacrifice on the cross. Much more so in the new covenant. Number one, perfection under the old covenant. Number two, perfection before the offering at Calvary. Number three, perfection obtained in the new covenant. He will perfect you. I said he will perfect you. Are you afraid of that perfection? Then why did he to answer? He will perfect you. Yeah. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. 
For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's the means of our perfection. He sanctifies us. He removes the Adamic nature. By one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. He's about to do it. He will do it for us. He will do it in every one of us. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's what he does. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Verse 21. Make you perfect. Make me perfect. Say it for yourself. Make me perfect. He will remove all the imperfection. He will cleanse off all the imperfection. He'll cross out all the imperfection. He will push out all the imperfection. Because it's the God who has given us peace, the God who gives us purity, and the God who gives us uh, this perfection. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work. In every good work. Look up here for a moment. You know there are people that say, Jack of all trade and master of none. They say, I'm not going to get into this and get into this and get into that because it will lessen my a kind of effectiveness. I'm just going to stay with this small scene and with this small area. Then I'll be all right. But you know what Christ came to do? He came to make us perfect in every good work to do his will. God, look at Paul the apostle. He was an apostle. Look at Paul. He was a prophet. Look at Paul. He was a great evangelist. Look at Paul. He was a great pastor. And look at Paul. He was a great teacher. Look at Paul. He was a great minister. Look at Paul, he was a great writer. Look at Paul, he was a great traveler. Look at Paul, he was a great uh, soldier of the cross, enduring hardness like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the grace of God came to him, and the grace of God made him perfect in every good work to do the will of God. Walking in you, he will walk in you. That which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, look at Second Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, having therefore these promises, the promises that can perfect us, they are there. We just need to take hold of those promises, have those promises, and have them in our lives. It will perfect us in Jesus' name. It says, having therefore these promises, deadly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting Holiness in the fear of God. Perfection, holiness in the fear of God. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The Lord will preserve you and present you perfect before him in Jesus name actually the ministry of uh, ministers and preachers and the leaders and of myself preaching to you is to bring that perfection uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers why Verse 12, I said, why? I said, why? 
for the perfecting of the saints. Are the saints here tonight? I said, are the saints here tonight? Ladies, saints, and men, saints, where are you? It will perfect you. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ, till we all come. How many of us? Till we all come. I said, how many of us? Are you part of this? Is he going to perfect you? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ is going to do it. He will do it in our lives. He will do it in every one of us. In First John chapter 4, First John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 17. First John chapter 4 verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. He'll perfect your love. It'll perfect your compassion. It'll perfect your care. It'll perfect your kindness. It'll perfect the grace of God in your life in Jesus' name. Herein is a love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. You wake up in the morning, remember that if Christ were here, what will he do? As he is, so am I in this world. As you go to your office, you're not like the people there. He has brought his blood to cleanse, to pour, to purify, to perfect you. And so you say, as he is, so am I in this world. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. The Lord has spoken to us today in our training, in our development. And he says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on. Let us go on. Are you in agreement? Let us go on. Are you with us? Let us go on, on to perfection, not laying again at the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do. And this we will do as God permits. The permission of God is there. It's written it there for us. It said, here is our chance now. Move on. We're moving on. Go on. We're going on. Here are the principles. Come out of that principle and make progress until we come to perfection. It will happen. In your life, it will happen. In your heart, it will happen. In your family, it will happen. In your ministry, it will happen. It's starting right now. When is this starting? Rise up and tell the Lord. Rise up and tell the Lord. There must be more fruit. There must be more grace. There must be more faith. There must be more devotion. There must be more love. There must be more diligence. There must be more sacrifice. There must be more compassion. There must be more service and more boldness and more forgetfulness of self and more obedience to the Lord. Tell the Lord today, tell the Lord today, do something, do something in my life more than I ever had. Do it, Lord. He will do it.